Good morning, everybody. Uh, and yes, good morning, because I am in Perth. Uh, and because I am in Perth, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I'd like to extend that respect to the traditional owners of the land on which you are today, uh, from wherever that might be uh, in Australia or indeed around the world. Uh, welcome to our second Q&A session for Fair Data 101 Express. My name is Matthias Livis, uh, and joining me today is uh, Nicola Burton uh, and Dr. Stephen McKechn. Sorry, Dr. Nicola Burton and Dr. Stephen McKechn. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Stephen is having some technical issues with his webcam, so you won't be able to get to see his smiling face, unfortunately, but you will be able to hear his dulcet tones. Um, so uh, this is week two uh, of Fair Data 101 Express, which means accessibility. Uh, I'm hoping that you've all had an opportunity to go through the two pre-recorded uh, webinars uh, on accessibility. Uh, and I do know it gets a bit heavy in parts, um, especially with regards to the standardized communications protocols. Uh, you will have an opportunity to interact with an API in the activities. Uh, and if you have any questions about that at all, please bring them up in the Slack channel. Um, now, uh, if you weren't able to attend the Q&A session last week, we are using the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, and um, this platform means that unfortunately you cannot broadcast questions yourself so you can't turn on your camera and your microphone and ask questions but there is a questions box or a questions module in the go to webinar control box uh, hopefully on the right of your screen so if you would like to pose a question to our panelists today uh, please type it in there and when we get to the actual Q&A section of the Q&A session uh, I will ask those questions on your behalf and I do apologize in advance if we don't have the opportunity to get to your question today, but we will make every effort to get answers to those questions uh, and share those answers with you uh, later this week. Okay, so uh, uh, as I said, accessible today, uh, and we have three speakers. Um, yes, so our third speaker has just managed to join us. Um, Hello, Melanie. So first up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Stephen McKechn from the Australian Data Archive, followed by Melanie Barlow from the Australian Research Data Commons, and then finally, Dr. Nicola Burton, also from the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, so uh, Dr. Stephen McKechn, as I said, is the Director and Manager of the Australian Data Archive, uh, which is a very, very interesting project. Uh, he also does some more work that we'll be touching on next week uh, in the interoperability section about self-describing data. Um, now, Stephen, I believe you have some slides to share, so I will stop sharing my screen and give you the opportunity to share your screen. Mm-hmm. So, how do I get screen share at this point is going to be the question. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in in the control panel for GoToWebinar, hopefully at the top yep. or near the top, there's a section uh, called sharing. Yep. Uh, no, it's coming through there. Um, so, uh, no. Okay. Um, and I'll do is Liz having a copy? I yep. also have a copy of is your Liz slides, on? so I'll just three. pull them up. There's only three of them, so. It, it should be pretty pretty straightforward there, I think. Yep. Okay, so just while Matthias brings those, uh, that brings those slides up, um, I, a, a bit of an introduction, say, to the archive and what it does and why we talk quite a lot about um, accessibility um, in, in this framework. So ADA, uh, Australian Data Archive, is um, nearly 40 years old and, and over that time we've been working with a number of different organisations over, um, over, over that time to share data, um, often from sources yeah, generally based on collection of information from humans uh, um, of, of different sorts, different locations, you know, different topics. Um, but our orientation has certainly been about um, data accessibility uh, for content that um, it's often subject to human ethics requirements uh, in particular, and that's you know uh, an emphasis for us. 
So so there we go, we've got the the slides up there. Um, We're based at ANU uh, here in Canberra um, in the Research School of Social Sciences uh, and have our origins in in the the, the social sciences. Um, And the the work we do is trying to uh, collect and preserve social science data. uh, And I cover a broad domain there. leading to health sciences and population health, some environmental science and, and other spaces as well on behalf of the, the social science research community generally. So over that time, we have collected over 5,000 data sets, probably 1,500 projects um, or what we would term studies, um, if you're thinking about um, uh, enabling access uh, to any different forms of metadata. Uh, the sorts of things we cover, national election studies, public opinion polls, social attitude surveys, uh, censuses. We work um, a bit with the ABS on different things, um, uh, some ag- aggregate statistics and administrative data as well. Uh, and we've worked across uh, different domains. Um, uh, academic um, originally, you know, we have content and we share content with pretty much every university in Australia uh, and internationally. Um, but uh, increasingly um, uh, collaborations with government on enabling access to data that's been collected either by or on behalf of um, federal and state uh, government agencies. Uh, and in some cases, even with the private sector as well. Uh, think, for example, like the, the, the Morgan Gallup polls and uh, essential polling groups like that, which are often collected by private providers. Um, so we familiar with the different types of domains um, and the different access expectations that come with those different domains. So both in ter- on the way in, what a depositor is looking for in terms of how they want their data to be managed uh, and to be accessible and on the way out, um, what are researchers and other potential users, um, again, across government, academia and, and the private sector, um, uh, uh, what are sort of the the conditions of access that they might you know uh, might expect to see, or that they are expected to comply with, depending on how you want to frame that discussion? Um, so next slide, uh, Matthias, if we could. Um, so I'm I've got three. Say this, that's the second of three slides. Most of what I'm going to say today is basically a summary of particularly um, content that I've drawn from our website. So we have a, a section accessing data there at the top of the page. Uh, there's a parallel section on depositing data, which cross-references that as well. So depending on your orientation as someone um, wanting to share or someone who is looking to access data that has been shared, you know, we're, we're providing both of those perspectives. And you can have a look at the website to explore some of that. But just to summarise um, some of the content that we've put together there to, for people to think about, um, certainly the, um, you know, we sort of walk through the different uh, procedures and expectations we have uh, and some of the standards and practices that we that we use uh, around that both depositing and 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 accessing data uh, in that uh, in our um, user user information on our website um, so yeah, broadly we, we summarize on the access side we're thinking about it from a user perspective the sorts of things that you you, you want to be looking at as your uh, coming into the system is you know how do you find content um, how do you get detailed information about that uh, and that uh, Matthias is kind of touching upon where you'll be going next week. You know, what's the level of detail that you need to be able to understand and use that information? That's one variation of accessibility that you might want to consider about consider as well. Um, it ties into both interoperability and particularly reusability as well. You know, to the extent you have sufficient information to be able to you know, make use of it going forward. Uh, and we have details on you know, some of the, the online analysis you can do uh, and particularly on you know, processes for downloading data. And that's the one I'm probably going to orient you know, people around today. Um, so when you're thinking about access, and particularly thinking about access of data from um, human populations in particular, um, as I say, often these, you know, um, these studies uh, will have gone through you know, at least some basic review, but you know, often in a quite detailed um, ethics application uh, through human research ethics committees uh, within universities or the agencies that they've been collected from. Uh, and that those access conditions basically set some protocols uh, for how the data can uh, be shared and on, on what basis. So as we we work somewhat with open data, but we, we, where we particularly work uh, most of the time is actually on what we might think of as mediated access. It's not, you know, um, you can't access it at all, but it neither is it sitting there immediately for you to download without any restrictions either. 
And that's kind of summarised in that statement that we have on the page there. Um, the archive is committed to open access to, for Australian and international research data for research and education purposes. However, that's balanced against our obligations to the participants in these research studies. Uh, and uh, often what we talk about in, in terms of discussions with our um, data depositors or owners is the also the obligations for, in terms of intellectual property, commercial value and other things uh, that might be associated with the collection as well. So different groups have different interests here and we, what we, we need to do is be able to balance those different interests. Um, particularly the one that we're concerned with and we're highlighting here is that, that consideration around um, you know, what are your privacy and confidentiality obligations to your, to your participants um, if you're a, a data owner or a data creator uh, is the one that comes, you know, comes to mind there. So um, we can go to the next slide, Matthias. So the way we think about that is sort of framing up different forms of um, access. Um, and I, I would, you know, to, to short circuit, one of probably the early questions that might come th through here, is there a standard way of thinking about different levels of access? The answer is no. Um, and, and this is, you know, we've worked over a few years now to, to iterate on what, you know, the sort of access models that we've um, developed. Um, but there is, you know, we don't actually have a, a recognised standard nationally or internationally for thinking about anything other than open access. Um, you know, open open is as you know as it sounds. It's there are no restrictions on access or use. Um, it, you know, when you think about um, limiting access, not stopping, but um, managing or mediating that access, then you you know the, the terminology um, is often bespoke. Um, and that's one of the challenges that we often deal with is how people think about these things. Um, what we've developed is a basic framework for looking at um, how you might uh, uh, come across that and then what sorts of expectations or what sorts of documentation processes we need to use to work with our uh, providers. Um, so we have their, um, as I say, open access is the starting point there, but I'd say I would say about 5% of our collection is actually open access that's actually quite well serviced by a number of different organizations. Um, the other three categories are what are, are our different mediated access models and here we, what we're doing is tying those sorts of questions around access to well, what what do you have to think about in terms of managing if you're not going to make it directly open. So we, we, we sort of talk about two, two standard types, uh, general and restricted access. The, so here the, the access is um, by request uh, and, the, and the question comes down to, well, who can make the decision about, you know, approval on access to that data? Um, so on, with our general access model, the, uh, um, the data provider, the data the custodian, approves ADA to make decisions on their behalf. And our restricted access model, um, the data owner uh, wants to make that decision themselves based upon information that we might collect. And we set up a, uh, a data request system uh, that supports that. So what we're trying to do is, you know, um, as you uh, manage that process of uh, uh, controlling access in different ways, uh, it, it comes with a much larger administrative burden. So what we're trying to do is sort of manage through these two standard models uh, to streamline that. But then we have a third case there, which is there are some cases where you just have ad hoc requirements. Different groups or agencies might want to know specific things or specific types of users. And so we, we negotiate. Uh, particular models with particular groups um, uh, around you know, that, that can't be kind of standardised into a into a, a particular model. The point about the say, I mean, this is that to meet different types of needs. Um, they are developed specifically to suit the types of processes and um, content that we have here, um, and um, we're trying to balance those different obligations we're talking about. Um, it is not a small workload. I have um, one and sometimes two staff working uh, several days a week to manage these requests. Um, so there are challenges and burdens that come with um, uh, managing that access as well. Uh, but as I say, it is you know the one means through which you can actually think about um, that trade-off between say enabling access for both you know public benefit and good open science uh, and the obligations to the you know the, the participants in your studies and the you know the owners of that data um, for you know the different sorts of intellectual property value that it might have. Um, 
So that's kind of an introduction to sort of the sorts of you know frameworks that we use. As I say, there um, we've developed those for our particular needs. Um, uh, there are developments certainly going on in uh, nationally and in, at state level on how different agencies might think about you know uh, their frameworks. We haven't seen one so much for the research sector um, in terms of you know some access standardised access models, um, and that might be an, an interesting discussion as well. Um, but it's a bit of an introduction to the sorts of considerations that we have and what what sorts of um, principles and approaches we're trying to think about when we're looking at the different access models that we might use. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Uh, and uh, we've already got some questions coming in for you, but we will hold those until the uh, Q&A session. Uh, okay, next up we have, sorry, I will stop sharing your slides. Uh, Steve, um, Melanie, are you there? Hello. Hello, Melanie. Um, let me, I will just turn you into a presenter. So you should be able to share your screen now. Thank you, Liz is gonna share for me. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, hear Melanie Barlow. Uh, Melanie, do you have a webcam you'll be using? Oh yes, there you are, okay. Uh, Melanie Barlow is a data Hello. consultant at the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, and oh, I need to make Liz the presenter. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I don't use GoToWebinar every day. Uh, Liz, you should now be able to share slides for Melanie. Um, Melanie is a data consultant at the Australian Research Data Commons, and she'll be talking to us a little bit uh, about the APIs that the ARDC has and uses. Over to you, Melanie. Great, so uh, thanks Liz for sharing those slides. I'll just make sure I can look at them too. Okay, so um, yep, let's just dive right into the first one. Oh, sorry, second one. Yeah, pass that one. Okay, great. So I've just lined our, let me just hide this little thing that there's again. So I've just lined our um, principles up there for accessible. So we can, um, everyone's pretty familiar with those already. So let's hop into the next one and I'll show you how we're gonna make some connections. Uh, so this is the um, mud map of what you might have. So your data, your metadata, you might have a metadata catalog API so that your metadata can be retrieved and you might have a data access or process or something service API for accessing that data. And then on to the next one, please, Liz. Uh, so now the services that we have available within the ARDC, we've got the Nectar Research Cloud, uh, Research Data Australia, Identify Services and the Research Vocabularies Australia. And um, in support of all of these, we have us people who can help you to um, access these and understand them and uh, learn about them like we are now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a shocking uh, a lot of things to look at at one time, but uh, all I've done there, and that's for your perusal a bit later so that you can start following all the paths, but in a nutshell, I've just um, specified some particular actions that might relate to those principles. And then I've pointed to what parts of your system they might apply to. And then, uh, so for example, if we just take A1 there, we've got um, metadata retrievable by their identifier. So then I've just got a little block box up there. Oh, thank you. Just saying that, for example, you might have a metadata catalog API and you might be able to retrieve metadata via its um, DOI. And so um, now down the bottom on top of the services, I've put a little bit of an explanation of what might occur. So pertaining to these principles in that first little blue, um, very rectangular box there, uh, that's to indicate that um, within your Nectar Research Cloud, you might have the data, you might have metadata, you might have the stores and the registries of these things. You could have infrastructure services and platforms or within the cloud. And then with, uh, within RDA, you might have metadata, so within your own institutional repository, but it's being harvested into Research Data Australia. And then within that, you might have the links to the actual data to be able to access. Uh, and then if, for the identifier services, that yellow um, 
together. Uh, we have where um, identifier services available for identifying services, data, samples, instruments, publications, etc. And these will be um, pertaining to your particular object, your service or whatever. But the metadata itself will have this uh, indicator, this identifier. And then, for example, within metadata, you might have the identifier for the service. And that might be in the form of a PID or something like that. And then in the next one, the purple one with the vocabularies, uh, you might have um, certain terms that assist with uh, the discovery of the data, obviously, but then also the format. So things that pertain to the um, accessibility and uh, well, later interoperability, but just being able to have sufficient information to be able to um, gain information and understand that uh, an item is accessible. And this is covered also by license, access rights, access indicators to that might be in your metadata. And then you might have controlled vocabularies for those kind of terms. Uh, so the next one, um, this is a little bit of a dive. So for the next uh, research cloud, um, this is the link to information to be able to find out about um, how the services offered within the cloud can assist with um, the accessibility or fair in general of data and metadata. And then next one, please. Uh, Research Data Australia. So for having uh, metadata available in Research Data Australia, it can harvest from metadata catalogs which are already in place. And similarly, it has its own uh, APIs for accessing this metadata uh, for um, machine access so that uh, metadata can be interrogated and understood and particular data for particular purposes can be found. Service endpoints for data can be discovered uh, so that data can be accessed and used. Uh, so we've just got a little bit of an example on the left there is the contributor page, for example, for Australian Data Archive and then a search results for finding um, the content and if you follow all of these links later you can get a bit of a closer look at things. Up in the top right there we have um, the access rights vocabulary for indicating um, accessibility for data within Research Data Australia. Um, that little thing down there that says supports open layers, that's an example of where within the data set metadata we've actually indicated uh, the link to that data via a particular service. Uh, and that's available there. And then down the bottom there is a lot more um, documentation for providing records to Research Data Australia and more generally about metadata itself um, there. And so the next slide, uh, thank you. So this is about identifier services and um, that's a link to information um, for subscribing and per, uh, for obtaining these identifier services, uh, the scope of what is available. And then we've just got an example there in RDA of having a DOI to a data set. And then um, that we can provide that under the access data link um, to take people off to the landing page within its native repository. And next one, please. Also, uh, and here's Research Vocabularies Australia. So we talked a little bit before about having um, controlled vocabularies used uh, where you can um, to assist machine understand, human understanding of what um, something is providing uh, with um, regard to access, license, um, and all of the things delving into topics and categories and parameters, etc. And here where I have um, the screenshot of the portal itself and then um, within that same page there, that one link, you can find all sorts of information to be able to dive deeper into using or and even publishing vocabularies. And so um, we, and associated with all of these are multiple communities of practice and um, interest groups, for example, that assist people with finding out more about um, these things, how to use them and what's being done. And then just the next slide, please, please. This was just a little bit of a reminder. So this was kind of to help people think, OK, I want to do this and I think I'm going to do that. OK, well, then how do I, going back to those other slides, how does this particular service uh, pertain to that? And um, just knowing that it exists and then to contact us to find out how we might um, solve those questions. And that's me. So thanks so much.
thank you very much for that, Melanie. Uh, a lot of information there, and I can confirm we will be sharing slides with everybody uh, after the end of this session. So you'll be able to click through Melanie's links and inspect her diagram uh, and, and learn much more about all of the different services that the ARDC has to offer. Uh, now, uh, speaking of communities of practice, uh, next up we have uh, Dr. Nicola Burton, a data technologist based in Western Australia, here with me. Um, and she'll be giving us a bit more about uh, some of our communities of practice. Uh, do you have any slides, Nicola? I do have a couple. Okay, I'll just make you the presenter, so you should be able to share your screen now. Uh, I am not, I'm not seeing that. I also seem to be frozen. Oh dear. I don't know if anyone can see me. Uh, <laughs> we can see there and hear you. Aha, perfect. Fantastic. Okay. We can see your, your whole screen, so you might like to, yeah, full, yep. All right, over yep. to you. That's what I'm doing. Okay, um, so I will be very quick so that we have time to get on to some of your questions. But um, hi, I'm Nicola Burton. Uh, I uh, work as a data technologist at the ARDC, uh, but in a previous life, I was a researcher in psychology, uh, working with lots of images of people's faces, which has given me a bit of an interest in sensitive data. So along with uh, ADA, um, so Steve, who you heard from, and Arnett, um, I helped to coordinate the sensitive data community of practice. And that's a community uh, where people can get together and share their issues, difficulties, and solutions around working with sensitive data. And uh, we, sorry, I think we have just slid off my screen. I'm going to see if I can find a way Right, that looks better. Um, so uh, we um, we work with uh, people working with all different kinds of sensitive data. Um, so uh, government data, uh, ecological data, health data, indigenous data, commercial data, and um, one of, one of the things that's in common between all these different kinds of data is that it's data that can't just be made openly available um, because it might uh, either there's legal implications because it contains personal information, uh, it could cause some kind of harm. Um, for instance, in the terms of ecological data, there might be a poaching risk for um, species. Uh, in terms of indigenous data, there might be culturally sensitive information. And so one of the things that's in common between all, all these kinds of data is that it needs to be controlled in terms of uh, who can get hold of it uh, and how they get hold of it. So we're talking about access and mediation. Um, so uh, one of the uh, things to bear in mind here is that just because this data can't just be made openly available, it can still be made fair. So it's perfectly possible to have data which I can't just hand out to anyone, but I can still uh, let people know exactly what it is, that I have it, that it exists, and I can tell them how to get hold of it. So for instance, I can say, well, I have this uh, ecological data set. Um, it tells you all about this protected species. Um, you know, I can't just give it to you, but I can give you instructions about how to let me know that you want it, um, how to get in contact with me, and, uh, and then whatever the solution is, which will allow you to access that data. Um, one of the interesting problems that uh, we do consider in this community is, is that in some cases, even the metadata itself can be sensitive. So for instance, in terms of commercial data, there may be companies who want to protect a commercial interest and they may be nervous about even letting people know that they are uh, doing research in a particular area or in the case of ecological data, um, Sometimes a piece of the metadata, such as the location associated with the data set, is in, is in itself sensitive because it would give poachers information about where those species are. So we have a lot of really interesting conversations about the correct way to display even the metadata that um, fully protects that data while also enabling it to be used in a way which will uh, advance whatever um, important research is being done. Um, yeah, so that's me. 
Great, thank you very much for that, Nicola. Uh, okay, so panelists who can do so, uh, could you please unmute yourselves and turn on your video? Uh, although I think I manually muted somebody before, sorry. We, I heard some laughing, so I manually muted one of the panelists. Um, and while we're here, there is Liz. Uh, so in fact, this is the first time that all three of us uh, organizing Fair Data 101 Express um, are on at the same time. I'm sorry, I was very busy having a root canal unexpectedly last week, so I wasn't able to attend the last session. Uh, so you can tell how interested I am. Um, so uh, hello from uh, from me, from Nicola and from Liz. Uh, we will be with you uh, the entire way through this four week course. Uh, and Melanie may also pop in and out with questions that she has. And uh, Steve, I can see you've also unmuted yourself. So uh, we have some questions in and I'd like to remind everybody that there is a question module in the uh, control panel for GoToWebinar. Please type all of your questions in there. Um, now, first up, I think uh, I might throw this one over to Steve. Uh, this is a question from one of our international attendees uh, asking what the relationship is between the Australian Data Archive and Research Data Australia. Uh, that's a question for Melanie and I, um, which is, um, so we've been working hard to actually figure that one out in point of fact. So, so Australian Data Archive is, so is, is based at the ANU and is, say, is, um, as a data repository fundamentally, um, resource for curation access of data sets. Research Data Australia is the metadata repository. Uh, and what we've been working with Melanie on is, um, uh, enabling our uh, metadata records to be accessible through Research Data Australia. Um, and one of the challenges we've been dealing with is actually how to represent access rights uh, and access models um, in Research Data Australia. So that's been a, uh, a long running battle that we've been fighting the good fight on, I would say. As I, and this is where this lack of standardization actually is, is something of a challenge because um, how do you, you know, in the absence of a standardized way of thinking about what access levels and access, you know, controls are, um, it's very difficult for Melanie, the, you know, the, um, one of the maintainers of the, uh, the RDA system to actually represent that consistently. Um, so we've been working actually to, to try and look at that. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and just a point of clarification for those who uh, are not from Australia, the ANU, uh, where the Australian Data Archive is based is the Australian National University, uh, which is in sunny Canberra. Um, okay, so, uh, <laughs> so not not sunny today. No, it is. Yeah, say it, so. oh, wonderful. Must be nice and cold then. Uh, yes, Melanie. I just wanted to add to that. Thanks, Steve. Um, so the ADA was the first dataverse system that we've harvested from into RDA. So we put a lot of work into that. Um, metadata crosswalk with Steve and Janet and so we um, can in theory reuse that for other systems that come on board and yeah that's mm -hmm. the, the beauty of ADC we have people like me who can really help with that crosswalking as metadata source updates and there need to be updates to the mappings. Great thanks Melanie. Uh, okay uh, another question uh, and I might throw this one over to uh, Melanie. Um, so just a clarification that the, uh, or rather the question verbatim, I just want to clarify that ARDC does not actually store any third party data. Yes, in Research Data Australia, we store the metadata only, then have links off to the data, wherever that might be via a service or uh, a direct download link. Research Vocabularies Australia does replicate vocabularies, uh, but these are, have their governance process to ensure that that's accurate. Um, it can do so, but then yeah, that model um, we'd need to have someone else talk about just what goes on there. Great, thank you, Melanie. Uh, okay, Nicola, here's one for you. Um, so according to this question askers ethics people, uh, the ARDC definition of sensitive data is not the same as the NHMRC's definition 
Uh, so yes, the NHMRC being the National Health and Medical Research Council who fund the bulk of medical research in Australia. Do you have a comment on that, Nicola? <laughs> um, I do not because I don't remember off the top of my head what the NHMRC's definition of sensitive data is, but I know that this is an ongoing issue that many people have very different definitions of what sensitive data is. Um, and it depends on, so for instance, a human ethics committee will be very interested in personal information and how that relates to the Privacy Act. Um, and it may be a more narrow definition than a definition which includes any data which could cause harm or in, in any other way needs to be made less than perfectly open. Um, so uh, if there's a, a sort of a more specific question about the difference between the definitions, I'm very happy to, to look into it and take it offline. Um, but I am aware that there are many different definitions of sensitive data. Um, yes, and uh, we've just received a clarifying note from one of our other uh, sensitive data specialists in the ARDC, uh, saying that we use the sensitive data definition from the Australian Privacy Act of 1988. Um, but I would like to reiterate your point, Nicola, that sensitive does go beyond just humans. Um, so the Privacy Act is all about humans. Uh, and I personally have a great interest in the, the conservation of non-human species. Um, so things like the Wallamai Pine, which uh, the location of which was kept really quite secret, but I think it's relatively easy to find out where it is now, unfortunately. Um, but look, we could talk about sensitive data all day, and I know that some of uh, our colleagues do. So uh, we will move on to a, another question. Um, sorry, we've got a few to have a look at. Okay, here's one question. Uh, and in fact, it is one about one of our uh, recorded sessions. So um, one of the recorded sessions referred to an example on the CSIRO data web portal where a link to the API was provided. Given that the API is so quote unquote open, what measures are in place to protect the integrity of the data within? Uh, and in fact, I might be selfish and I might take that question myself. Um, so when it comes to providing access to data through an API, uh, first and foremost, that the most important principle is to only put, uh, give the API itself access to data that you wish to be made available, as it were. So um, creating an API that can access literally every piece of data that you have is probably not a very good idea if some of that data is really sensitive in nature and you don't want it to get out. Um, so after deciding which data your API can share to others, uh, the next step is to build authentication and authorization uh, functionality into your API, which is one of our uh, FAIR guiding principles. Uh, and so the idea there is that the authorization procedure is, is a very human procedure that determines who is allowed access to what, uh, what kind of data, and they're given different levels of access. Uh, in fact, kind of in the same way that this webinar is being run at the moment, those of you, the people you can see here, we have a higher level of access uh, than the attendees. So we can share our microphones, share our web webcams, things like that. Um, and then after determining who is allowed access to what, you build, a, build in a mechanism by which somebody can prove they are who they say they are. The most traditional form of doing that would be through say a username and a password. Uh, but there are other ways of uh, being able to determine, to authenticate who somebody is. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Happy to take any more on that. Um, okay, what other questions do we have here? So uh, Steve, I think another one for you. Uh, so the, the question is, do you think it is possible to align access conditions with types of consent? Oh, uh, Steve seems to have lost his audio capability. Oh, wait, he's back again. Steve, yes, are you there? Audio. Can you run that by? <laughs> I yes. couldn't hear you. So okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you think it is possible to align access conditions 
uh, mm -hmm. with types of consent? Uh, that's a good question. Um, You're more than welcome to take it on notice and have a think about uh, so, it and provide an answer no, no, later. It, it, it's, so we've been, so I, mean, I presented the access conditions we have as we sit, as we have now. We've actually been thinking about um, how we streamline those a bit more in, in point of fact. Uh, and I guess the interesting question there is, uh, actually in principle, yes, you could. Um, I'm just trying to think of, then you have the secondary problem of thinking, um, Types of consent. Okay, what's our framework for types of consent there? Um, you know that that. So we we hit another stand, you know, sort of standardisation problem. It would probably be the case that you could, if you could have a agreement on that. But uh, you know, to take one example, we've got a um, uh, the longitudinal study of Australian children. Is it you know um, they actually get um, consent on a number of different. Uh, issues within the study. So they're linking to tax records and medical records and the like. Um, so the, the question partly would become, um, how would I frame you know, um, a standardised model for what, what that level would be? We actually do do, we do this in a manual way actually at, at ADA, um, which is, so you can kind of pull apart the data a bit more and look at, and we, we do differentiate levels of access in discussion with our depositors in conjunction with the sensitivity of the data, and which is kind of aligned to the consent style there. Um, but I have to say, this is probably, you know, that and that, 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 that special access model that I actually touched upon in our, uh, in my presentation, it's, it's a bit of a rabbit warren though, to start thinking it through. So, um, Yes, it, it, you would have to have a pretty interesting type of design and a sense of what, you know, what type of consent is this? Um, it's, not a, it's not immediately obvious to me that there is a, a sort of a, a standard way of thinking about that. You know, have I got consent or not? What is the form of consent? You know, what have I consented to that, you know, there's, as I say, that's opening up a can of worms that I, I think it would be hard to get, a stand, you know, a, a reasonably standardised model that's there, but you could at least go some way to try and you know, classify that, I guess. Um, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, so a further comment from the, the questioner, uh, and I have to admit this is something I'm not entirely uh, across. Uh, it's apparently the NHMRC does have different categories of consent or the level of consent, uh, general, extended and unspecified. Um, I don't know if any of our panellists know any more on that. Nicola, perhaps? Um, no, I don't know the specific details of the, of the clinical trial um, consent. Um, it's maybe something for our health and medical specialist to, um, to fill us in on further. Yes, uh, absolutely. And we can uh, get that person. Sorry, I'm protecting privacy. So I'm only naming the names of our panellists in this session. Uh, so we can, we'll get our, uh, our specialist health and medical can I, data can I, specialist. Can I follow up on that quickly, Matthias, which is to say, I mean, I'm familiar with the idea of unspecified consent, which is in a sense, you don't define the particulars of what the you know, what the additional sharing or the additional usage might be, which has, has its advantages for data sharing. Um, the, I'd say the, the, the problem is not in the framework, it's in the, it's in the implementation, okay? So when it comes down to requesting unspecified consent, you know, so you can have some generic terms there, but every consent form is different. Um, and so it, it, it's not in the, in, in the high level versions here, it's in the specifics of what they've, you know, what your actual consent process was, um, that that it becomes difficult here. Um, so as I say, yes, you've kind of got frameworks there that you could do, but I think you would actually have to be more specific than that. If you're going to align the access models with that because, um, as, as you know, to take the example, the, the LSAP example I had before, you know, there are seven consents that are being given in that, in that um, uh, data collection. Um, 
that become, you know, how do you actually design a system that, you know, designed to actually accommodate all seven of those consents is that, you know, there's a practical challenge here. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yes, I get what you mean. Uh, okay, we are running out of time, uh, or have, sorry, have we actually run out of time? I can't remember now whether this was meant to be 45 minutes or 50 minutes. Um, so look, as it is, we are, look, I will call it, we are at the end of time because it's only three minutes away from 10 to the hour anyway. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all the questions during this session, but we will make our best effort to answer those and share those questions and answers with the entire community. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank everybody for attending. Uh, I'd especially like to thank our panelists, uh, Steve, Melanie and Nicola. Uh, and I would like to remind you all to please give us your feedback. So after this webinar ends, you'll have the opportunity to give a little bit of feedback and we'll use that to improve the next session. Uh, and I'd also like to remind you all about our Slack workspace where we can have some very lively discussion. Uh, so if you have any more questions that, you, that, that only come to you after this session, please ask them in there. Uh, and also if you have any questions about the activities that we've set for this week, uh, could you please uh, raise them in there? One of them in particular can get a little technical um, and, and I can absolutely assist with any kind of technical issues. Uh, so we'll leave it at that.